All right, it's good to see everybody here this evening. Look forward to our time of worship together. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 449. To God be the glory. 449. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life a redemption for sin, and opened the life gate that we may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. We sing there that the one who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. It's not that... Believing is when the pardon occurs, but it's when we receive it in the sense we it's been revealed what Christ has accomplished there at Calvary. Let's take our Bibles and look together in Matthew chapter 4 for our scripture reading. Matthew chapter 4. This chapter has to do with the temptation of our Lord Jesus Christ, right after his baptism, when he was brought into the wilderness, there's some that compare this with Israel being brought out of Egypt, which our Lord was as a child, and crossing the Red Sea, and then entering into the wilderness to be tempted, Israel for 40 years, but here, the Lord Jesus Christ, comparatively, 40 days and 40 nights. There's something to be said here as we read this about Christ, who is the true Israel, fulfilling what national Israel could not. I truly believe that's what this is about, where natural Israel failed, our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled. And it says, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Some find that odd, but everything about our Lord's path in this world, in this life, was directed by the Spirit of God. The Spirit was given him without measure. And so 
even here with regard to his temptation, he was not left alone. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. That word tempted means to be tried because Christ as the substitute had to be that perfect lamb. He had to be tested in every way and yet without sin. And so when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger that shows his humanity that he would not partake of any food for 40 days and 40 nights and in that then be hungry. He endured everything that you could ever imagine that comes with being a man and yet without sin. And when the tempter came to him, notice here he said, if thou be the son of God. So right from the get-go, the tempter is questioning our Lord's nature and his person as the son of God. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. I will tell you that every one of these three temptations that we have here has a match back in the Old Testament, particularly in Deuteronomy, where Israel was tempted and failed, just as here in verse 4, and he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, and that's, that's cited back there in the Old Testament with regard to Israel. When they murmured and complained about their position there in the wilderness. And so Christ answered Satan according to the very temptation that had been the reason for the fall back in the Old Testament. Now, he was actually here being tempted or called upon to question his father's goodness and to distrust his father's care for him. In essence, here you are hungry. If you're the son of God, why don't you just command these stones to become bread and eat? Could Christ have done that? Yes, he's God. And yet nothing in his earthly pilgrimage did he ever use to his advantage. He came as a man to represent men, and he faced every temptation as a man, but God being his sustainer. Then it says the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, you see here it is again, if thou be the Son of God. He knew he was the Son of God. Because this is that very one that had cast him out of heaven back even before the creation of this world. Where Christ said, I saw Satan fall from heaven. So he knew who he was. Where Satan thought he had the advantage was the fact that now he was a man. And so even as he had caused Adam and Eve to fall, because he's the murderer and liar from the beginning, so he, in his mind, imagined that he could get Christ to be tempted. And here he's presuming upon his father's power and protection. Everything, when he says son of God, he's, He's addressing this against his father. And he's quoting scripture. Don't ever think because someone can quote scripture that somehow they're the Lord's. Satan, the scripture says, believes God and trembles until the devils. But if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels. Notice, it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou should thou dash thy foot against the stone. So Satan can quote scripture, but he can never quote it in context. He can never quote it aright. It's like so many today that are preachers. They will 
quote scripture, but it, a, a, a scripture taken out of context is a pretext. And here he, is, he had but one view to tempt our Lord, just to cast himself off that temple. And let's see the angels, what they'll do to protect you. So he was quoting Psalm 91, just like in the beginning, in the fall. Satan quoted the words of God to Adam and Eve, but to the woman, but quoted them backwards. He quoted as if God had said they were not to eat of every tree of the garden. When God said, you may, except for one. He made it sound like God was withholding his goodness because he wasn't letting them eat of every tree. So beware of people quoting scripture, even today preachers, because they're ministers of Satan. They transform themselves into ministers of light. And so don't just take their word for it. How many preachers I hear say, well, we haven't got time to turn there, just take my word for it. Really? I want to look. I want to see what you're saying. Well, I want to see what the context is. And that's where our Lord said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. That's where that's quoted. So again, every one of these three temptations had been addressed to Israel in the Old Testament. But Israel had failed. Here's where our Lord, as a substitute of his people, would not fail. And again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Again, people read that and think, well, that, that's because these things pertain to Satan. God never gave this world to Satan. But Satan is presuming upon his power and authority in the world as if he does own it. He doesn't. And that's why our Lord Jesus, verse 10, said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And that's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13. So, imagine our Lord saying that to Satan. You have but one thing you need to do, and that is to worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Well, that was the turning point. None of, this, none of this else matters. It's like baiting over subjects and scriptures today. What think ye of Christ? If you want to ever bring a conversation, people love to throw subjects out there and get you spinning. What think ye of Christ? If they can't bow to him as he is in, uh, in truth, but when, you, when you center the, the argument there, you're going to find out they're going to do just like Satan. They're going to leave you alone because their interest is in Christ. Satan is no more interested in bowing to the Lord, his God. Because even though Satan was cast out, he, he, Christ is still his creator. Christ is still his judge. Christ is still his authority. But rather than bow, the devil leaveth him. And says, Behold, angels came and ministered unto him. That's not cheap with regard to the temptation of Christ because even the book of Hebrews says that he, his, his angels are his ministering spirits unto the heirs of salvation. So even here, but such was the depth of our Lord's temptation here to the point of being weakened in the flesh, not in the spirit, but in the flesh. These angels came and ministered unto him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali. What I see here is that where gospel is not 
received, the Lord himself will withdraw himself. When, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. How was he cast into prison? But according to the will of God. Some might look at that and say, well, he was, he was leaving John to himself. No. Our Lord left there and went into this area, as we're going to see, for one reason. It says, leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is on the seacoast in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali. Look at verse 14. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulon and the land of Naft Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Just like this chapter begins with the Spirit led Jesus into the waters to be tempted of the devil, everything Christ did was directed by the Spirit and was in fulfillment of the word, just like this temptation. He had to answer every charge with it, which had felled the people of Israel. Our Lord now answered with his righteous obedience. And now, going into these regions, this wasn't just haphazard, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. If you want to keep a notebook, every time you see scriptures might be fulfilled, write it down. Look at, look at how the scriptures, everything Christ did, Right on up to his death was according to what was written. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When it says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it doesn't mean it's coming soon. It means it's here. And his message was <clears throat> repent. That wasn't an invitation. It wasn't an offer. It was a command. Repent have a change of heart and mind toward God, even faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Acts 20, 21 tells us is the meaning of repentance. They're not two separate things. Repentance is faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ is repentance, and it's the gift of God. Some will say, well, if God didn't purpose to save everybody, why command everybody then to repent? It's because God can do no less than demand repentance of sinners. He's holy. He's just. And left to ourselves, some say, well, if, if God would just leave the choice to us, well, read through Scripture. Every time he left the choice to any sinner, that, that sinner ended up in condemnation. I thank God, as I stand here tonight, that he did not leave the choice to me. I heard this command, repent. I didn't know what it was. None of us did. Command to believe. We had some definitions, but when it pleased God to reveal Christ to me, then suddenly that repentance was given. It's a gift of God. Faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing myself as a sinner, being given eyes to see and to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a gift of God. But that was Christ's message. Plain and simple, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why is the kingdom at hand? It's not talking about the sweet by and by. It's talking about when he walked this earth, the kingdom of God was at hand. Because the king was at hand. Where there's a king, that king rules. But even as a man on this earth, he was establishing his kingdom. Not a physical one. People still looking for a natural earthly kingdom. No. This kingdom was established in the, the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ and his bloodshed as the chief cornerstone on which his church is built. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, cast in that into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They, again, hear the, the direct call of the Lord. Had the Lord just walked right on by, they might have by curiosity looked at it and thought that, okay, there goes Jesus. But his call to them to follow him, that he might make them fishers of men. In other words, to lay aside their 
earthly occupation to be given this, this mission to go and preach the gospel of Christ and to see through the preaching of the gospel sinners drawn to Christ, fishers of men, to cast the gospel net. And notice, they straightway left their nets and followed him. That's the effect of God's grace. They didn't have to sit down and negotiate terms or think, all right, we'll do it eventually. Now, straightway, whenever God is pleased to act in his grace, that's what it is, straightway. They left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, the ship was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And look at verse 22, immediately. This is the effectual call of the Spirit. It's not begging them. Immediately they left the ship and their father and followed him. That's what Christ said. If a man doesn't hate his father, mother, brother, and sister, he cannot be my disciple. It's not hate them in the sense of being mean spirit toward them, but nothing is going to keep them from following Christ, no matter what the earthly relationship is. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. It wasn't some earthly kingdom yet to come. He was preaching his kingdom that was at hand, that would be established fully, freely, and finally his death as being the chief cornerstone, his righteousness unto death, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. In the Old Testament scriptures in Isaiah, that was the sign that he was the Messiah. So these signs accompanied his preaching for that reason. And his fame, his renown went throughout all Syria. Interesting, isn't it? Not just Israel, but Syria. They brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. This shows our Lord as sovereign. If he can heal the worst of diseases, it tells us then that he can certainly heal or deliver worst of sinners. That's what we see. He healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. And ultimately, the Lord's going to sort it out whose were his and who weren't. But such is the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your blessed son becoming a man, enduring all manner of temptation, of trial, and yet without sin. I'm thankful that we have the privilege, even now, of opening your, your word and reading it and uh, contemplating it, that Lord give us eyes to see, spiritual eyes, so that it's not just what our mind receives, but that it's truly of your spirit taught to our heart. Thank you that we are commanded to repent and to come to, to you through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ alone, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And for that, we give you the praise and we look to you to bless. I pray in our dear Savior's name. Amen. Let's sing one more hymn before the message. Hymn number 442. Praise him. Praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. 
Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Let's take our Bibles and look together in 2 Samuel chapter 21. I'm going to read from verse 15 down to verse 22. And I've entitled this study, No Enemy Can Prevail. There's a reason I read Matthew chapter 4 for us to see how our Lord endured all kinds of temptation and opposition. Yet, as God's anointed and appointed king, there was no way that he could fail. We see this typified in David as God's anointed king. And one thing that we realize is that so long as he was alive as king, the enemies continued to try to dethrone him. It was true in our Lord's earthly ministry, even to the point of when they had crucified him, sealing the tomb to ensure that nobody could come and steal the body and say that he was resurrected. And yet none of that could stop him. And here we are today, thousands of years later. There's no difference in the hearts and minds of men. They still have Christ as their enemy. They will not have this Christ to reign over them. That's how all of us are born in this world. If tonight we worship Christ in truth, it's because God by His Spirit gave us that repentance to bow. Else we would be just like anybody else out there, rebels to the king. So here in 2 Samuel 21, what struck me, Remember the old Philistines? They've been defeated more times than you can imagine. David has whipped them. And yet it says, moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. Sinners born in this world are warmongers. They will do anything but bow to Christ as he's revealed in the gospel. And so David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines and it says David waxed faint. This is why I read for you what we read in Matthew chapter 4. Because when Christ came to this earth, his was a very real suffering that he endured. People say, well, he was the son of God, so it, it really didn't affect him. As a man, there were times when he was weakened. We just read about it in Matthew chapter 4, that at the end of those 40 days and 40 nights of his temptation, God the Father sent those angels to minister unto him, to strengthen him in his flesh. I remember one other time where you read in Scripture, it was that way in the garden. 
just before Christ went to the cross. When he prayed to his Father, if it be possible for this cup pass from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. Christ was under the weight of what it was, the just one, that bare the sin of the unjust. We treat that just like a theological point. Oh yeah, he, he endured. But think of what it was for the Son of God as a man to endure what he did and how it would have weakened him to the point where it says there that he sweat as it were drops of blood. It doesn't say literally drops of blood coming up, but as it were drops of blood. Such was the trial that he endured. And even at the end of that, an angel came and ministered unto him. Because again, that was something that God would do for even any one of his own. These angels that serve God day and night are sent as flaming spirits for those who are his inheritance. That's what it says in Hebrews 1.14. So here David waxed faint. It shows that he was a man, even as Christ in his suffering was a man. He hungered, he thirsted, he slept. Those aren't acts of sin. Those are effects of being in this flesh and living in this fallen world. But David waxed faint. And Ishbanab, Ishbibanab, which was of the sons of the giant. We're going to find here four giants that are mentioned down through here. So just like with Goliath, that was their strength, and David fell in him. Now we're going to send some more up against this man. Don't think that they took it lightly, because these are all from that area where Goliath had been defeated. And Ishbi Banab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, why do you think this was a new sword? Well, because David had taken the last sword and it cut his head off. So he's thinking, I'll come with a new sword. This is the way all those that, that come against Christ, even Satan, though he was fell there from the beginning, thought himself capable of bringing the Lord down. Here it says, thought to have slain David. We didn't get him before with Goliath, but here now are, are the sons of the giant. They had one ambition, was to slay David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, succored him. So we can see where David, as the, the God's anointed king prevailing, but also now his ministers, his servants. See, this is the thing even about Christ, he, he gathered his disciples of, about him and sent them forth to do battle. That was his purpose. Here was one in the Old Testament that we've seen very faithful to David all along. One of the priests, son of Zerah, suckered him, helped him, and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle that thou quench not the light of Israel. They were concerned that somehow he would be taken out and uh, the light be then removed. This was out of love and compassion for David. He's getting up in years and uh, said to him, you stay here, we'll go and do this battle. And it came to pass after this, that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibishai, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was the son of the giant. So there's your second giant. Every one of these giants that they send forth. What we have here is a picture of representation because these giants represented those Philistines. If they could win this battle, then they would have conquered Israel. And it's true. In, in Scripture, everything's by representation. You've got Adam, by which all fell into condemnation, and then you've got Christ, the representative. 
there's the seed of the of the serpent, and then there's a seed of the woman. There's enmity, but it's by representation. Here, every time one of these giants raised its head, it was with the, the purpose of bringing down one of the Lord's representatives, David, or even these, Abishai, any one of these representatives. And yet they could not be successful. So again, no enemy can prevail. I don't care whether it's sin, Satan, the world. There is nothing that can cause God to fail in any way in what he has purposed through the work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that it's that way. Even now, it's not my doing and dying that is going to win the victory. It's what Christ has done come back to his representation there at the cross. Therein is the hope of those who are the Lord's against any end. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ said, I will build my church there in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against Here we go again for the third one. There was again a battle in God and the Philistines where Elihanan, the son of Jari Orjim, a Bethlehemite, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. These were some big representatives. And yet none of them could stand against what God had purposed in blessing David and blessing his kingdom. As we read here, I wanted to mention that this, in verse 18, Shibashai, the Hushathite that slew Saf, he was actually from Judah, the tribe of Judah. And then here we have a Bethlehemite. Both of these are representations of, of that seed that was to come years later who would fight the ultimate battle and bring down every enemy against his people. But here in tight picture and promise, a lot of times we think of prophets and priests and kings that are well known in the Old Testament, but go back and read some of these names. There's not a whole lot we know about these men, but they were raised up for this one purpose to stand against these enemies, that no enemy could prevail. And then the fourth, here in verse 20, there was yet a battle in Gath. This is, this is in that area where Goliath had reigned. An enemy is an enemy still. And I read here, and again, war, and again, war. Anything that comes from man is going to war against God and his anointing. Like it says in Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage? Well, they want to break their bands. That's what we see happening here. That's the, that's the nature of this flesh, that God should not reign. People get upset today that there is only one way of salvation. Well, that's not fair. Look at all the people in the world, all worshiping different ways. One way of salvation. You can fight all you want to against it, but day of judgment, Paul said there in Acts chapter 17, that God would judge the world by one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in one standard, that righteousness that he came and earned and established, and God imputed once for all to the account of his people. If, if Christ is our representative, if he has paid our sin debt, then God has forever justified us through his shed blood. And there's nothing that could ever change God's mind or cause him to say, depart from me, you work in iniquity. Because his righteousness has been established, just like here with David. There wasn't going to be anything to take away this kingdom. But again, this battle, there's a warfare. Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rules of darkness. Here was a man of great stature. 
that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. If I count correctly, that's 24, right? That's a lot of fingers and toes. Now there is a medical disease I read where even today people are born like this. It has some fancy medical name, but it's a it's a birth defect. And when I read that, it, I thought everything about us is the result of the fall. The fact that you look at your own hands right now or your body and you think, well, it's everything's the way it's supposed to be. And then you look around and see all these people that have deformities and everything. In reality, that's the way we all ought to be. So even the fact that we can stand up and, and move and, and use these bodies in a functional way is a mercy of God alone. But here was this man, great stature, had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. But notice, in spite of his stature, and some might look at that, well, extra hands and fingers, you could do a lot of extra damage that way. Still, he was a rebel when he defied Israel. Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So there again we see that no enemy can prevail. You can see why David here serves the type of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God has anointed and appointed him to be his king and that none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? I hear a lot of talk about just how evil the world's getting and isn't it terrible? It's not nearly as bad as it could be. I'll tell you that. And don't think just in terms of what's out there in the world. Consider what's in here. When I consider the sin of my own nature and consider how it is that even now I can stand here and give the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ alone. That's a work of grace. That's all it is. It's not anything in me. It's not anything in you. It's, it's God being pleased to take wretched sinners and to save them for Christ's sake. But one of the blessings, just like here with David, being in this place of authority and power as God's king. And really, every victory that we have here was for a people. Because again, representation. Had David been killed, had David fallen, either him or his servants, then that would have been a victory for the enemy. The wonderful thing today is that even though the enemies rage, they can't get their hands on Christ. He's no longer bearing the sin of his people. He died and rose again and sent it on high. But the reason why God purposes that his church should suffer in many ways is because it keeps us looking to Christ. Even as I consider in this flesh dwells no good thing. You say, why when God converts the heart, why doesn't he just take away the flesh? The only way this flesh is going to be taken away is death. That's when it's going to be buried. When we die, it will be gone. And when we raise, these bodies are raised with Christ, it will be the corruption taken on incorruption, mortality taken on immortality. I've been pondering this a lot. I don't know why the Lord has it on my mind, but think of what that will be. In, in this earthly flesh, we can't even imagine scriptures say it, the twinkling of an eye will be changed. And we'll see him as he is. But right now, what's our hope in living in this life? We have the same enemies, without and within. But the hope is that no enemy can prevail because the work of Christ cannot be undone. It would sooner be true for Christ to cease to be the Son of God than for anyone for whom he died or for whom he has paid the debt, now to be cast off. 
he'd have to stop being the son of God. And that'll never happen. Never happen. As I was preparing this week, the Lord directed my mind to Isaiah chapter 54. We'll finish up with this, Isaiah 54. Here's the song of what we find in Scripture. And this is a verse that I've heard people in religion quote. It's almost like they hold up their their fingers like this whenever they think they're facing evil and they think that that's okay no weapon formed against thee shall, shall prosper that's they hold up the, the, like the cross or they wear it around their neck and they pick it up and they kiss it but that's idolatry that's not the meaning of this verse here this whole chapter has to do with Christ and, and the fulfillment when he would come but in Isaiah 54 in verse 17, we read, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. There's the sum of the gospel. This is a psalm of what we're studying even here with regard to David, that no enemy can prevail. So how is it that no weapon formed against one of the Lord's shall prosper? Well, this is written to those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ paid the debt. That's why in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 it says, There is therefore now, since the cross, no condemnation, none. No sin, no Satan, not even the law of God can condemn anyone for whom Christ has paid the debt. Why? Because Christ has paid it. And it says there, their righteousness is of me. That means it's not in here. This is a righteousness when this was written that would yet be worked out when Christ came. So these, in hearing this, would have looked forward to that day when God would send his son into this world and they would pay that sin debt. And he would pay that sin debt. And the reason that there's no weapon formed against God's child or the church, so this is true individually, but it's also true collectively. Just like David was the representative for his people, for that kingdom. But the reason no weapon can be formed you have to go all the way back to the eternal love of God. The love of God is unchanging. Oh, to be able to get a hold of this and to think that those that God has loved in Christ, nothing can separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. This is not some general love. God loves everybody, has a wonderful plan for their life. No. This is God's love in Christ. And what those he purposed in love to save from eternity, there, there's no changing of God's mind. I don't know about you, but that gives me some comfort because in my flesh, I'm just as evil as I ever was from the day of my birth in this flesh. So how is it that I can stand here tonight and tell you I have a hope? Not only have a hope, but have a good hope. It's because of what I read here. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. No sin, not Satan, not the world, not even the law of God. Because Scripture says where there's no law, there's no transgression. Think about it. For the believer, for the child of God, the one for whom Christ paid the debt, there is no law against them. Therefore, there's no transgression. Think about that the next time that you know you've grievously sinned and had your mind and heart turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and to think that even that the Lord paid the debt and there is no condemnation. I, I become overwhelmed when I consider that. That's what the scriptures tell us. That it's, this is for those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ paid the debt, therefore no condemnation. And that Christ is building his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hear what it says, every tongue that shall rise against thee 
in judgment, thou shalt condemn. It's not just that the church is passive, hunkering down, weathering the storm of opposition or persecution. Now, this is this is talking about standing and against the going into the very gates of hell where Christ says that they'll not prevail. They cannot keep Christ from saving any one of his own. So who's active there? It's Christ. I don't know who they are. But Christ does. He knows everyone for whom he paid the debt. And in the day of judgment, every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. It's not that in the day of judgment we're going to be looking around and saying, well, nah, 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 nah. We won't have to say anything. Christ is our defense. Christ is that answer. Christ is that advocate. He will be the one that condemns all that stood against him. So even though enemies will be stirred up and gathered in battle, it's, it's against the church and against this gospel. But in reality, it's against Christ. It's anti-Christ. It's against the head. It's like here, these, these giants that arose, they, they wanted one person dead. That was David. But they never got what they desired. And the day's coming when all of these that stand opposed will be overthrown. And uh, anything involving the beast or the false prophet, human government, false works, all that will be taken and cast alive into the lake of fire, even with Satan himself. All of this predicted right here. And then the last thing I'd say here is church is the heritage of the Lord. It says this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. The blessing of being the Lord's, of being of his body. That's not something that we earn or merit. It's, it, it says the heritage. That's an inheritance. But to enter into an inheritance, it takes the death of the Testator. So the church may suffer physical harm, even death. I think we live relatively peaceful lives right now, even though you look around, you think, well, how much longer will it be before some of our freedoms are taken away? It may be in our lifetime, it may not be. Or it may be that the Lord directed centuries from now. He's Still, this, the church still continue to enjoy some measure of, of peace. We don't know how the Lord is directing, but we know who's directing. And so, regardless, nothing that men can plot or plan against one of the Lord's will ever be able to shake or move that foundation. And the reason is what it says right here. Their righteousness is of me. I'm thankful it's that way, aren't you? Because if it was up to me, there would be no righteousness. But their righteousness was of me. This is the very righteousness of God that the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to earn and establish. I've mentioned this before. That's why it's called God's righteousness. It's never called Christ's righteousness. Christ never said, my righteousness. Everything he did was for his father. So how do we know that the father has accepted that work of Christ? Well, he calls it his righteousness. <laughs> he owns it. There's no righteousness in any other but in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he had finished the work there at Calvary, that's why there's no arguing or debating about when this occurred. When he finished that work at Calvary and said, it is finished, those words mean something. That means there's nothing left to do or change or alter. It's done. It's finished. There remained nothing but for God. God's a just God. He doesn't withhold what is just. And so the just payment having been made, that righteousness then imputed there and then to the spiritual account of every one of his elect from the beginning.
beginning of time all the way to the end of the world. There's still some yet to be born in this world, just like we were. Born already justified before God. That doesn't mean we're, we were born uh, regenerated. No, that comes with time. But any that God has justified by the blood of Christ, he will in time reveal his son in and draw them to himself. He, he cannot lose one. That's the joy when you hear this gospel. And it's the Lord directing the gospel in his time too. It's not when I decide. I was pretty settled already thinking I knew God. And then he had to shake that old gourd, bust it, break it, and uh, shatter it and show me that, no, this matter was settled when Christ died. Not when I believed, but when Christ died. And no accusation of men or devils. Men want to dig up dirt on you. They can. It's getting easier these days on the internet. You can just you can do pay $35 and do a, a public search on somebody and find out every speeding ticket, every anything they ever did wrong. It's out there. If it's really bad, you can find out. But none of these things move God in his love or in his grace or in his justice to ever cast off one of these. And in the judgment day, it's not going to be us answering. It's going to be Christ answering on behalf of his people. There's no judgment to come. People still talk like, well, he Christ died, but we're still going to have to give an account for our deeds and our doings. Well, if that's it, then there's none that are going to be saved. That means God would be unjust to punish his son for the sins of his people and then turn around again and then chastise him for those very sins. If you look over in Romans chapter 8, again, no enemy can prevail. Romans chapter 8. We could read the entire chapter, but I'll just close with verse 32. He that spared not his own son, spared not, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Freely. I don't have to try to earn God's favor by how I live. I could never do that. No, but I bask in his favor. Why? Because of Christ. I live freely because of Christ, not fearing the enemy, not fearing the law, not fearing sin, not fearing the world, not fearing Satan. If I'm in him, it says here, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So when the Lord says back here, their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, that's not just anybody saying that, that's the Lord. We either believe him or we don't. This is a declared righteousness. If I'm looking in here, I don't see much evidence of it, any of it. If I'm looking around, I don't compare myself with others. There's nothing in me that can attest to this being true other than the word of God. And he goes on, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who even is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This goes all the way back to God's eternal love. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? There's seven things listed there. Seven's the number of completion. <laughs> you can't anything do it. It doesn't matter. As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's, that's our end. We're born in this world to die. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors. How? Through him that loved us. Just like David back there and his servants conquering on behalf of his people. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to to separate us from the love of God, but there's a comma there. Where's the love of God? Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a pretty hopeful message right there for those that 
are the Lord's. No enemy can prevail. I'm thankful that that's the case. All right. Let's take our hymn books and sing one final hymn, and then we'll be dismissed. How firm a foundation. Great hymn to sing. Number 268. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, it is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God, I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my gracious, omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of woe shall not be overflow for i will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie my grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus at least for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though a hell, should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Three times, no, never. That's great.